A lot of people look at this young Kings team led by Mike Brown and they see the Warriors offense 2.0. Younger, home court advantage, and some would say nothing to lose. Are they going to be the ones that finally close the door on this dynasty? Now, I didn't want to get too deep into the rabbit hole trying to break this series down. It would have taken me all week. And so I want to keep things simple, but very specific in the key matchups that are going to determine this battle for Northern California. Today's video is brought to you by SeatGeek. 28 million downloads, 70,000 live events on a given day. It's playoff time. It's playoff time, right? And the battle for Northern California is on. Warriors, Kings. Now, there's a lot of talk about home court advantage, travel, crowds. Can Dub Nation get up to Sacramento and split that crowd and take away some of that home court advantage? SeatGeek is the way to do it. Green Dot lets you know you're getting good value. It's the only app with a buyer's guarantee on your tickets. And you know I'm going to hook you up. Use the code promo ALCHEMY to get $20 off your tickets. Listen, I, I'm not going to be able to make it up there, but if we get a Warriors Suns Western Conference Finals, you know how I'm going to get my tickets. It's through SeatGeek. So again, link in the description. Use the promo code ALCHEMY for $20 off your tickets at SeatGeek. Obviously, when you look at these two offenses, you're going to see a lot of similarities, specifically dribble handoff and split actions. The big difference being Sabonis is just much more of a threat on the roll or if you switch than Draymond or Looney. Now, I've seen a lot of Kings fans dismiss the Looney-Sabonis matchup. Here's the thing about Looney. It's kind of like aging. You don't really worry about it until you start to feel it. Outside of rebounding, Looney may not fill the stat sheet, but you feel him in a series. His presence, the back tap for a three ball, the 50-50 ball on the baseline, sliding over for a contest. With Looney, it's not about an individual matchup. It's more of an accumulation of all the little things he does to connect the Warriors team. That said, it's going to be a real challenge for him, one that we can't run from because you can't hide him on their other forwards who will spread him out in the corners and make him guard the three-point line. So how do they deal with all these Sabonis handoff screen actions? Switching, that's a tough ask for our guards because Sabonis, he has great footwork to go along with the strong base. He's not your typical modern big who doesn't have a back to the basket game. He will put our guards in the basket. I think they have to use different coverages based on personnel. If you have GP2 or Dante involved, having Loon or Draymond in a conservative drop is probably the way to go. Leave room for them to have the choice of shooting the gap or fighting over the top of the handoff action. If it's Clay or Wiggs, we could try switching and see how they hold up. The bottom line is they will have to switch it up and not show the same coverage too much. Remain dynamic and look, if Herder or Monk is cooking, trap it. Play the math game, threes versus twos. On the flip side of things, that's all the more reason why Draymond and Looney have to remain aggressive on their dribble handoffs. Whether it's a fake one or a hard roll to the basket, they have to keep Sabonis and the Kings defense honest by not allowing them to hard trap our shooters coming off those handoffs. And that's where Kaminga could come in really handy. If you start running the handoff actions with him, He's going to create a lot more vertical spacing and pressure downhill on fake handoffs or just hard rolls to the basket. Do we see him with some minutes on Sabonis essentially at the five spot? I don't know if that's something they want to do, right? Kaminga, as strong as he is, he still doesn't really play down in his hips and he tries to outmuscle you with his arms rather than his hips. And that's going to be a problem against Sabonis. At the same time, his foot speed and vertical attack could be just as much of a problem for Sabonis. No doubt they're going to do it by committee and throw a wave of bodies and fouls at Sabonis. And then ultimately, you'll probably see Draymond on him in clutch minutes. And that brings me to De'Aaron Fox, where I think the Warriors will take the very same approach. The difference being, I think they have more bodies to throw at Fox. And you're going to start with Andrew Wiggins, which... That's a tough ask for him coming back after all this time. And then you're going to throw GP2 at him. 
Dante, Kaminga will get minutes on him. And you know, Fox is very good now at that mid-range game and we know his speed getting to the basket. They have to do their work early and in the backcourt. Make him work and make it a war of attrition. Wear him down. He's going to get the whistles in the paint, but I think they're going to be able to be very physical with him off the ball and above the arc. The approach has to be much like when you face Ja Morant. He's going to get his, but how hard did he have to work to get it? Wear him down and ultimately make him inefficient when it matters most. As far as he and Steph goes, you can headline that matchup, but the truth is I don't know how much time they'll spend guarding each other. The number that I would watch between the two is free throws attempted. And that leads me to the X factors of this series. For the Warriors, I think it's really easy, right? It's Andrew Wiggins. What does he look like upon his return? Is he confidently shooting the three ball? Does he have the conditioning to play heavy minutes? He looks thin. Where's his strength level at? And just his mindset. Because if the Warriors get a healthy and hungry Wiggins, I think we all know that sways the series heavily in the Warriors' favor. But is that a realistic ask? No doubt there's going to be some cobwebs and rust to knock off. But if he's in the right mental space and he's physically healthy, the type of athlete that Wiggins is, I think defensively and his floor game should come along quicker and then eventually the shot and rhythm should follow after. Now, I feel like the X factor for the Kings is none other than Kevin Herter. 23 playoff games with the Hawks where his splits were 41 and 33%. But the difference is in Atlanta, he had to create a lot more of his own shots where in this offense, he really is the tipping point in what makes them elite. His off-ball movement and gravity as a pure shooter, right? He's a guy that can shoot moving left, moving right. He doesn't really have any tendencies that you can lean on when it comes to getting his shot off. If you can take Herter out of the series, which is easier said than done, you're going to dramatically reduce the potency of this King's offense. And I'll be honest with you, Clay starting on him, probably not a great idea, but hey, Clay has proven us all wrong so many times, but at this point in his career, he's just not great at navigating screens and staying attached. And so I propose the question to you, as ludicrous as it may sound, what if you put Clay on Fox and Wiggins on Herder? Kind of with the idea of, hey, Fox is probably going to get his either way. Let's try to contain Herder and take away that gravity he provides the rest of their offense. The other element of that would be cross-matching. Could you get Wiggins matched up on Herder on the other end and let him ISO and go to work? Because that leads me to my next point. Both these offenses are difficult to contain by nature, right? And so if both of these defenses are going to struggle, your offense becomes your greatest defense. And this is where Kerr and his staff, I think, have a really interesting choice in philosophy. You hear that old adage, well, we're not going to adjust to them. They're going to have to adjust to us. But I think that this is an instance where because the systems are so similar and the Kings are younger and have the potential firepower to outgun us, it would benefit the Warriors to slow the pace down and play a traditional high pick and roll game. Let your offense be your best defense. Cut down the possessions and make Sabonis and Fox work above the three-point line defensively over and over again where the Warriors' experience executing in a playoff atmosphere will be more magnified the slower the game is played. The other huge positive to playing that way is I think it gives Jordan Poole the best opportunity to positively make a big impact on this series, right? We know he's at his best in high screen, clear out ISO action where he can get to the line and really single-handedly put the other team in foul trouble. Kaminga and Wiggins have the potential to do the same thing, but again, we know we usually see that when it's slowed down in high pick and roll basketball. Now, Inevitably, things will change as the series plays out, adjustments are made, and choices are made. But I'll propose to you a question in the details for each side. We know Loon and his impact on the offensive glass, but when you look at a Dante or a GP2, a Kaminga, the way they like to come flying in on that offensive glass may not want to do that against this Kings team that's the best in the league at running it back the other way. Are they going to call off the guards and wings from hitting the offensive glass, or are they going to live with the consequences? From the Kings' side of things, listen, we know how young and inexperienced this team is, 
there is without a doubt going to be one of their young guys that has a welcome to the playoffs moment and basically shits himself in the series. The question I have is, how long of a rope does Mike Brown give them? Does he let a Keegan Murray or a Davion Mitchell play through their early struggles, or does he go deeper into his bench? This is going to be a tough matchup. There is no doubt about it. And I think the question for me is, can the Warriors resist temptation of just playing traditional Warrior basketball? Fast pace, off ball action, right? This is a rare matchup where they could possibly get outgunned if the pace plays that way, right? And so I say, let your offense be your defense. Control the pace, traditional high pick and roll basketball. Does Steve Kerr have the nerve to have a GP2 or a Dante in there as opposed to a Clay or a Jordan Poole in key moments of the series? These strategies are going to go a long way in determining who pulls this out. I'll leave you with this. I've heard a lot of talk about how great this Kings offense is, the greatest of all time by the numbers say, right? Well, it's being blown out of proportion, just like how bad their defense is right? It's all relative to how the game's being played in the league today. And it's very simple. The offense is way up and the defense is way down. So no, they are not the greatest offense of all time. But I also in turn say their defense probably isn't as bad as the numbers suggest. The question is not, can they defend? It's will they defend those habits, right? Those habits are created along the season. And you could say the same thing about the Warriors. The difference being, we know that they can. And so when you hear the cliche word flipping the switch, well, it's just a lot easier to flip that switch when you've already done it before. And that may be ultimately the difference, the experience. I've got the Warriors in seven. Hit that like, share, and subscribe. I'm out, y'all.